So welcome to everyone this afternoon and to those of you who are on, on Zoom. So um, I want to talk to you today uh, around, about making vaccination campaigns work, uh, something that's actually very topical and, uh, as you say, essential if we are going to get the high vaccination rates that we want to have in the current situation. So I want to start, first of all, with just the, the information and the picture from the flyer that came round to you. And as I say, the words, part, the experiences from past vaccination campaigns, whether New Zealand or overseas, and tell us that an effective vaccine, supply and distribution system, and people to give the vaccine are necessary to make a program work. Now, so those are absolutely um, essential, but also they tell us that if people don't actually get vaccinated, then a program's not going to be successful. And so that's my focus um, that I want to talk about today. So past campaigns, oh, I think I just wanted to mention the, the photo, which comes from a colleague who's been helping me on my uh, research. And this is just an example of, this, this was from Nepal, but the initiative came for these vaccinations from local officials and the local community. So it was bottom up initiated. So past campaigns then will tell us both what has worked and also what hasn't worked. So there's lots in there. Now, my research has mainly been on, has focused on Nepal, as Chris said, but I've also been looking more widely and that's included New Zealand. And I want to um, acknowledge here the wonderful work that two of my honours students have done looking about vaccination attitudes within New Zealand. And if you notice, um, the first one, Jess's dissertation, that was 2018. So before vaccination became so topical. And so they were both extremely enthusiastic getting into the project and each sort of focused it on what they became interested in. And so I'm going to be drawing on some of their work um, later. And I know that um, Lisa, had every intention of zooming in today. So I'd like to say thank you to both of them. And seeing that Thelma is here from the Health Sciences Library, I would also like to acknowledge the wonderful help that I get from the library and also the wonderful resources hidden away often in storage in this university's um, library. So I'm going to talk a little bit about smallpox eradication and its link to COVID-19. Then move on to why Nepal's smallpox eradication program was successful. And that's a very important question when you look at the immense challenges in a country like Nepal. And then the last part will be around vaccination more widely and sort of making um, a program work. So let's start with um, this, this picture from the magazine of the WHO, May 1980, proclaiming smallpox is dead. This was the official pronouncement that the clinical disease of smallpox was no longer around. So that's 1980. 40 years on, and this is May 2020. This Headline, lessons from the 40-year-old victory over smallpox can be used to combat coronavirus today. So let's look at this global, um, let's look at smallpox 
and sort of the global campaign. And just to introduce you, because um, to smallpox, the disease, and some of those features will be in many ways very familiar, although you will, won't see this today. So it's an acute contagious viral disease transmitted mainly person to person, mainly by infected droplets. Now today we talk about, the, um, you know, the R number of things. It didn't have, what's important here and really significant is the high case fatality rate of variola major and no cure. So one in three, up to one in three people, if you got the disease, could die from it. There was another minor, variola minor, another version, much less severe. And Nepal, which I'll be talking about, had variola major. Smallpox, long history, origin unknown. Importantly, no animal reservoir, which helped contribute to making smallpox a candidate for when it decided to have a go at eradication. But it's been preventable by a vaccination since the late 18th century. It spread widely and indeed by the mid 20th century had been eliminated from many countries. So that's the situation mid 20th century. So despite vaccination, despite everything, in the early 1950s, an estimated 50 million cases of smallpox worldwide, mainly Asia, Africa, and South America. And so, because there are various features about smallpox and because the idea of eradication was sort of a current idea at the time, the, the decision was uh, made to have a go at going for worldwide eradication. So 1958, 1959, the World Health Assembly decides to undertake that. And, um, but it was, there were few resources beyond what, what they had at the time. Now more was achieved during that period than, has, that, than was acknowledged. It's things like China, we didn't learn about until much later. So in 1966, the, the WHA decides to intensify activities in countries where still endemic. And this led to the start of the, the global intensified smallpox eradication program. And this was what eventually led to success. Now I've put in bold, it was based on mass vaccination. Uh, the strategy changed later to surveillance and containment, and I'll come back to that. 1973, we get the final phase. 1977, the last natural case of smallpox. And as I say, 1980, we, the official declaration that smallpox had been eradicated globally. So that's the sort of just the brief outline. And this, the picture here is, this is the official history. It's vast, it's online, but it's also, we have a copy in the, the library here. And to have this 1700 page document, book rather, is, is quite special. But there's a very much a global narrative of why smallpox eradication was successful. So it talks about the triumph of cooperation between countries. And I've noted here, despite Cold War politics at the time, of how biomedical activities can unite people, uh, how the World Health Assembly provided the forum to agree on a global health goal, goal. And then the WHO, the World Health Organization had the links with national authorities to coordinate and implement the policy and draw on international scientific expertise. So, so something we've heard a lot about the importance of the science. And a lot of new research was done during the, 
the eradication campaign. Central to success was seen to be the small wet network of professional WHO staff who could then work with and mobilize a large number of national staff. Now, this is um, really uh, important, but it's also not the, the whole story. And I should just briefly mention at this time how uh, international health programs at this time are very much part of the development activities post Second World War. Smallpox eradication was always really about health rather than development, unlike mal malaria eradication, which was consuming vast resources at the time. And then there's this idea that technology and foreign experts could solve the health problems of the developing world. And so this is very much the sort of the idea that underpins such a lot of what happened at the time. Now in Nepal, they struggled. And this is why I had to sort of think, when you look at these challenges, you had to think about how on earth did they actually do it? Because this is usually what's given to say, this is why things don't work as they're supposed to. So it was one of the world's least developed countries, very rugged geography, divided by major river systems. Um, nearly 97% of its nine and a half million population rural, that's scattered right throughout. Very limited educational facilities and health services, and so very few trained health workers. Poor communication networks. And if you're going to do taste testing and tracing, you've got to have a communication system. It takes you a month to get a message from the far west of Nepal to the capital. You can't sort of test and respond to an outbreak. Very few roads. There's an awful lot of walking was done during this program. And then the monsoon made it even more challenging as rivers flooded and you couldn't get around. So how was that program made to work and how was it gonna reach those scattered population? And I put just this picture in, uh, we just so that you can visualize just what that map um, was trying to demonstrate the different regions. This is the high mountains of the Mount Everest region. So just starting with Nepal pre-1960s, uh, a long history, but no numbers. Um, and in fact, other diseases were far more of a problem in Nepal than smallpox. It was, smallpox was very widespread at this point in time, and it could reach the mountains as easily as the more densely populated areas. It was common, um, especially in childhood, and looked after in the home. And then, the, as I say, variolation, the, an old practice was used, which loses live smallpox matter rather than the milder um, version of vaccination. So variolation was practiced because there was very limited access to vaccination. So that was the situation um, around sort of that time, those are say the early 1960s. And I just want to mention here people's attitudes. Um, despite being unable to access it, people knew that vaccination or variolation um, could prevent the disease, although not everyone was in favor. Um, people didn't like vaccination side effects. More traumatic meth methods were used to vaccinate, leading to infected sites. Um, and this is the picture of the, the temple in um, Swayambhunath to the goddess Sitala. Now, belief in the goddess did not necessarily mean a person was opposed to vaccination. Often we see that lumped together, if you believed in the goddess, you wouldn't get vaccinated. 
but there were ways um, around that. Nepal is um, Hindu, predominantly Hindu country, and so most people were in favor of vaccination. So, as I said, very limited vaccination, um, some by the government, but in a few places, and ad hoc by others. So, for example, any of you who came to the lecture a few years ago when we talked about Sir Edmund Hillary and the smallpox epidemic in the Mount Everest region, um, and that was in the valleys in that earlier picture, that did vaccination and the same with the, the photo on the slide on the, the flyer how um, it, they did vaccination but it was very ad hoc but in 1972 there's a joint government and WHO pilot project starts in the capital to try and see if they can start establishing a core of sort of expertise um, and to see whether they could make it work in the capital. In 1965, a community smallpox vaccination initiative was um, led by the Nepal Medical Association, uh, started in two districts in the south. They used trusted local vaccinators and their vaccination rates were much, much higher than the official pilot. Now, what's important about both those initiatives were they provided the foundation for the later um, eradication program. So you can learn about what doesn't work and you can learn about what does work. Because when the 1967 intensified program starts as part of the global program, using mass vaccination, but they used these temporary local vaccinators uh, to get greater accept acceptance. And then the program, and as I say, with few workers, few things, gradually expanded district by district. So that was the unit, the way it sort of worked. Importantly, there was new leadership, a new head in 1969, and a very experienced WHO advisor who knew how to work in, in the Paul's context. And those two did have a very important role. They were also there for something nearly sort of six years, so it gave stability. So that was important. And I've just put this here, it's a more modern map, but this shows the the district structure. Nepal had 75 districts in the mid 60s, went through major administrative reorganization. And so the project got out to each of those districts. We then have a new strategy in 1971. And what's important about this one is instead of mass vaccination all the time. It's limited to one month in the winter. And this aligned people's long-standing preference about when to vaccinate. So despite it being just a month, the number of vaccinations increased because even when vaccination first introduced into Nepal in 1816, that peer understanding of when to vaccinate appears in the, the early letters. What this then did was freed up time for staff to focus on the new global strategy that was really being pushed to surveillance and containment. And I'll talk on the next slide and just explain what I mean by that. Then 1973, the pause pro program has got nationwide. 1975, the last case, and in 1977, an international commission certified smallpox as eradicated from Nepal. So what was key to that expansion was training. Um, a bit around sort of the epidemiology and diagnosis and particularly around how to do surveillance and containment. 
And in fact, by putting this, you will recognize some of that because we hear a lot about that today. Active searching to find sort of cases, so the testing, you didn't do the testing, you, you had other ways of learning how, whether there were cases in the community. Then rigorous isolation of patients. And then I put in bold here, both ring in brackets, because that's very much part of an Otago story, as I talked about last time, and Professor Cyril Dixon of Preventive and Social Medicine, um, who is now beginning to reappear in the literature. But it's, as well as the surveillance and watching the close contacts, vaccination. And that's what hasn't been sort of used um, this time. What's important about that, it was a way it helped contain, but also it was a way of reaching hard to reach, um, hard to access groups. The, the training became particularly important after the change in strategy in 1971. And I've again put in bold, great reliance on the district supervisors. So yes, national team could go out, but given all the um, geographical environmental challenges, that you couldn't rely on that. Um, and so you had to actually not only have district supervisors in name, you had to be able to trust them, you had to be able to rely on them. And as you'll see from the quote I put at the bottom, these were not necessarily people who had any training in health. So they came from various backgrounds. Now this role of using decentralized and using the district supervisors was um, noted in a letter to Dr. D.A. Henderson, who was head of the global program in Geneva, to Dr. Satyanathan in, in Nepal. And he felt there was something the global program could learn from what was happening in Nepal. And again, it's picked up in the official history, which is the only published account of Nepal's um, eradication program. But with a 1700 page book, it gets lost and it's lost out of the, the record. So very important. And I put here this quote to demonstrate how the system works. Um, so the team does go out um, from Kat, um, Kathmandu, this is to the far west. And when they get there, um, they find that all was, all was put in hand. It was all well done. Um, not everywhere was well done, but in this case, it was all well done. And as they noted, this was the district staff's first experience with a smallpox outbreak. So, um, as you say, a lovely example of how that system was made to work. And they did put trust and reliance. Um, I've talked with Jay, both who was the WHO technical officer, and Dr. Benu Kaki, who was the Nepali doctor at that time. So what does Nepal's story tell us that's useful for implementing a vaccination program and getting people vaccinated? And so some of the things that emerged was you had to work, you had all those geographic and communication challenges, you just had to work around it. And by effectively decentralizing, that's what you could, because if in the monsoon, the river flooded and cut it off, cut off one district from another, if you had staff in another area, they could still carry on dealing with what was needed. They took vaccination to the people rather than expecting them to come. They were helped because people believed it worked and the newer freeze-dried vaccine that was used had fewer side effects, um, was better in the warm climate, and the new bifurcated needle was less traumatic. And Nepal had a sufficient vaccine supply, and this was enabled through WHO. 
as I've mentioned before, people's beliefs could be harnessed to support the program. So about when to vaccinate. Trust and community participation, very important. And the legacy of all this has been, in fact, since the expansion and support for vaccination. Um, so it was, it was Nepal's first nationwide healthcare program. And I've just mentioned here, but I am also conscious of the, there are lots of stories around vaccination stories. I just took this picture of one of the female community health volunteers in Nepal taking out polio to, um, as part of her activities. Uh, this was one of the sort of the big posters at WHO when I was doing um, a seminar there a few years ago. The other picture, however, is a reminder that things go wrong. And the quote for this picture was, um, that I came across in the archives was people were saying injections kill babies and nothing to do with vaccination, but a baby died after an injection. This child in these upper valleys of the Mount Everest area was the first in these upper valleys to be vaccinated for nearly 15 years. It takes time when you have bad experiences. It doesn't just sort of happen. And um, people have to want to get vaccinated. And this was, um, this, was, this was when we were there. We were there just it, that it happened in our time was chance. But this was the first. And then gradually family after family after valley from village after village came in. We ran out of vaccine. We sent back. We got more. It was um an amazing experience so um how do nepal's experiences relate to the wider vaccination story so um so thinking about attitudes uh for as long as there's been vaccination there's been a spectrum of attitudes has existed from the most ardent supporters to the most fervent opponents at the other end. And then you have this range of people in the middle with all sorts of barriers, multiple views, all sorts of questions. This, um, as I say, uh, you've only just got to go back to the early stuff and you'll see that right from right from the start. And New Zealand, no different um, to elsewhere. Now, New Zealand um, obviously has changed dramatically since um, the 19th century in smallpox vaccination. But what Jess found in her project was that really the overall themes that concerned people then have really changed little issues around discrimination, safety and efficacy, moral and ethical issues. Now, at any time, these are either exacerbated or mitigated by how visible the presence of the disease in the community, adverse vaccine events in New Zealand or overseas, and information and misinformation dissemination. And I'm going to talk a bit more about some of these. New Zealand's vaccinates and rates traditionally low and vaccination opposition has a long history. Now, each one of the different campaigns that they've been over, over time have had different features. In the case of diphtheria in the 1930s and 40s, there weren't many cases, so people didn't really see the need to get vaccinated. Uh, so despite sort of promotion of being safe and simple and free, 
and that diphtheria was, de sort of was, de was deadly. It struggled against this um, uh, lack of people not didn't see it um, particularly as important. Whereas in the 1950s, the widespread presence and visible severity of the polio epidemic, ep epidemics increased uptake. Update. And you uptake, and you can see today how we get those similar flurries when a new case appears around New Zealand in a different, in a different sort of centre. Adverse events have occurred, um, and this refers to the contaminated diphtheria and toxin in Bundaberg in Queensland in 1928. Um, where, as you can see, this was from the local newspaper, 12 local children died after being vaccinated. Or you can think about the measles, mumps, rubella, the MMR vaccines linked with autism in the now discredited study, which was published in a leading medical journal in 1998. Both of those reduced uptake in New Zealand in either the short term or as we know with MMR in the longer term, and it's still an issue. Now I've put in here, because this is something very topical, New Zealand and compulsory vaccination. So New Zealand introduced an act in 1863, making vaccination compulsory against smallpox. It hurt the poor most, for financial and sort of access reasons they couldn't get to it. But the fine was something like it more than a week's wage. Now, when incomes are low, it, uh, that really hit, hit people. But it became impractical to enforce many exemptions and, in fact, achieved little success in raising coverage. Um, and it just said less than 25%. This was written into one of the health reports in 1902, when there was a smallpox epidemic in 1930, 40, it was even, it was even less. And so compulsion, unsurprisingly, has dropped out of the legislation in the 1920 Health Act, which was really important in setting up New Zealand's system. But of course, it's reappeared as mandated vaccination. Uh, in other examples, but now particularly with COVID, um, for a large section of the population. Now, second point to just mention is the importance of trust. Vaccination uptake better when a relationship of trust exists with the person either giving the message vaccination or promoting the message. And this has become really important because there is an increasing number of vaccinations, vaccines, and they've become really, it's more controversial. The involvement of the large pharmaceutical companies rather than public sector institutes that has also contributed to this um, suspicion around um, vaccines. Uh, now I've just put an example here, how with the pertussis vaccine in Britain in the 1970s, and there was concerns about it, but by then officials knew that it, patients and parents trusted a message more if they got it from their local GP <laughs> rather than the government or other sources. And so they promoted the, the message via that route. Um, role and boundaries of the state and district, they continue to be important. And again, another um, UK example with MMR crisis, uh, the British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, in late 2001, refused to confirm his young son Leo's vaccination status. So yes, there was privacy in this and think, but if he wouldn't confirm, then what would people to believe? And so vaccination rates dropped further. It's also important this awareness for tailored strategies and the need has become 
very much aware in New Zealand to better reach populations, that we need to really know that our communities, we need to work out how best to reach them, whether it's our different Pacifica communities and the, the differences between whether you're from Tonga or Fiji or Samoa, this really matters in terms of health healthcare delivery. And even last year with the, the Maori influenza vaccination program, they increased uptake by using a whanau-centered approach, pop-up marae, focusing on Maori workforce capability. Yet these valuable insights have been very slow to be introduced into New Zealand's COVID-19 campaign and so contributing to lower vaccination rates. They could have been, this could have been done right at the start. And so lead, that very much also leads into this last um, point. It's really important, make it easy for people to get vaccinated. Today, childhood immunization is a routine in New Zealand and overseas. But COVID-19 targets mostly the adult demographic who make their own decisions. But we know from past campaigns, the need to adopt a bottom-up approach, involve communities, go out to people and just make it easy. Barriers need removing. As I overheard somebody in a coffee shop on Saturday talking, and I decided to add that extra sentence. And um, that's what... Um, and I put here an, another example um, here from Brazil, an escalating meningitis epidemic in 1974. The government deciding to vaccinate, their goal was 80% as quickly as possible. In a few months in 1975, um, 90 million Brazilians, so that's more than 80%, over 8.5 million square kilometers were vaccinated. That's an amazing achievement. So yes, authoritarian politics, and yes, people um, feared the disease severity, but the campaign approach, and this is really important, was to vaccinate without disturbing the rhythm of people's lives. So they were vaccinated wherever, whenever, during activities, at work, at school, vaccination sites set up everywhere. They did something like 10 million people in five days in Sao Paulo. So it shows you what, you know, what, what can be done, but it is make it easy. And so um, just to conclude from overall from the different parts. So Nepal's experiences, I think, are important to understanding the global story because in contrast to the top-down centre-led narrative of much of what's been written, success in Nepal was also achieved through effectively decentralising um, the structure, key responsibility to the district, smallpox supervisors and aligning when they vaccinated with how people believed it when it should be done. Then if we move on to New Zealand and, more, and so that more widely, right from the start, the need for science and politics to be aligned has been stressed stress throughout the COVID-19 pandemic response. But a vaccination program also needs much more if it's to be successful. And as I've been trying to um, sort of show you that past campaigns have already told us that understanding people, their lives and what matters to them are central to getting people vaccinated and so making a program work. This is not new knowledge. Um, we just haven't learned the lessons that actually are out there. And as a postscript, uh, this is, as you say, Everest Base Camp. And May 2021, this year, 
fears of serious outbreak. The, um, the area had been in lockdown, was opened up, um, and expeditions started coming in and COVID came in with them. Local people sort of went back to villages. Um, there was no vaccination things at that sort of point. And so the concern was, what are we going to do? And there's actually been um, an extraordinary story in this um, area because the local, um, the local services, and again, this is um, again with the New Zealand um, connection with Kundi, has set up so that they can manage in the community. They can't. They don't can't do intensive care, but they've um, trained. They've got oxygen um, in the community. They've trained local people to go and help. They have people on oxygen in the home. Um, and so they're managing cases in the community and they're getting vaccinated. And the very high rates, uh, in many ways, there's no reason to disbelieve the 98% that is actually being claimed because you actually, when you're in a small community, you know, you know your population. So they, it shows you you can do it. So they both manage, they're managing to look after patients and they are, they've, they've got vaccinated. And so there I'd like to finish. Thank you. I'll keep an eye on the chat there for anyone on Zoom for questions. Uh, we'll pass it out to the audience. So thank you very much, Sue. Uh, and just to point out too, we've alluded to the talk four years ago. Yep. Uh, this is available for you to, uh, to revisit if you wish. Uh, uh, Omsa now has a YouTube channel. So our videos uh, from talks from the last four years are now uh, a bit more easily available for you to view. Uh, so there's some wonderful talks there. So please do go back and revisit that. And likewise, this will, will become available over the next few weeks on there as well, uh, if there's anything that you missed and wanted to, uh, to check again. So, uh, questions? One of the things, thank you very much, Sue. I, I appreciate you talk very much, especially the last clear slides. Um, one of the things that seems characteristic about the problems associated with COVID is the politicization of the anti-vax movement versus vaccination. Was that a feature elsewhere and any suggestions of how that can be overcome? It's, I think politics is, is, is always um, involved and you look in different places, for example, um, I've heard things, for example, in, in New Zealand, how some um, people, if they're in rural areas and maybe vote for national, don't want to support something that's seen as labor. Um, in America, you've seen how um, differences between Republican and Democratic um, sort of areas. Uh, there, when it goes back to smallpox, there always, you know, there was politics, and I think there always is around uh, campaigns. Um, one of the problems I think today with the anti-vax and is the huge role of social media, and this was something that's really been uh, it, it's exploded with. Um, with COVID, it's been around and it's been increasing. Uh, and so that makes the voices of um, the anti-vax minority very loud. And the problem is, in terms of numbers, 
they are still a low, very small proportion. There's this large group who, in the term that's become very widespread now, who are seen to be the vaccine hesitant. And these are the ones who've got questions. And uh, if you can work on them and solve them, they're the ones who will get vaccinated. And they're the ones who will increase your rates. Uh, talking to, to my son just the, um, just the other day, he was really pleased because he's been working on this family for, um, he's up in Wellington, um, and he's been talking with his family for ages. He said four of them have now gone and got their first vaccination. Um, so it's patient, it gets very frustrating um, and, it's, and it's difficult, but I think we have to focus and keep focused on this group who, who will get it um, and overcome their barriers, overcome the challenges. Um, and it, because really you're not going to ex change the extreme anti-vaxxers. So you've, you've, you've um, got to do that. You, you've, people have had to learn to also with messaging and things be smart because the anti-vaxxers really took to um, social media. So again, those running the campaigns, running the things, it's really important that you can combat that on, on, on social media. Uh, so it's perhaps it's, it's a, a diver, it's concentrating on those that you can have a better chance of influencing because every one person vaccinated is one nearer that target that you want to get to get to. I was intrigued by your, the information that smallpox vaccination started in, in Nepal in 1816. Yes. 1816. So in 1816, most of the world, you know, like literacy rates, education mm. has been low. But experience in Nepal compared to other countries, um, it would be like, the acceptance rate and the actual implementation mm. rate in Nepal, is it much better than, say, you know, a country in Africa or what, even Eastern Europe? What the smallpox, um, when it was first, when Jenna and the end of the 18th century uh, first introduced the smallpox vaccine, it spread around the world remarkably quickly. Because uh, people, people also understood that when you, if you got smallpox and survived, then you were unlikely to get another one. They also they came to realize that this did actually work. When you actually look at how smallpox vaccine was made, and the, I wonder anybody sort of. Um, did it? It was complete. Um, the story, and there's a fascinating book about New Zealand's story with smallpox vaccine. That's up, the Cotter Medical History Trust. There's a little book that's fascinating about New Zealand's story. No, so it spread widely. There were problems. It was linked also with colonialism and issues like that. Um, different, and so it was it both introduced, but also met all sorts of opposition and things as well. In Nepal, it was brought in, but it never, despite um, it didn't spread. And so in the case in, in Nepal, 1816, and then hardly any for a century and a half. And so that's why there's hardly any in 1950s. Now, just then mentioning your point about literacy, uh, and these, yes, very low levels, but you actually don't need to be highly literate in a sense. In our sense, if you believe something works, you don't need to actually know all the science. If you believe it works, you're going to you will take it um, up. And I've found that you know from talking with part of this research, talk, I've been in. I was talking with, I call them my um, grandmother 
sort of interviews because they were the mothers looking after who had children who died or were looking after children with smallpox and so discussing sort of their story many of them had not been to school and things but they came to they they learned that small that the vaccine worked and it would prevent that um, heartbreak of Nepal and in the or is in many countries um, where vaccination and as you saw no more sort of cases if you're in a vaccine if you're in a country where it's sort of endemic still you've got the heartbreak of look of people with the disease so that does increase up, uptake but also you've got the problem of trying to you know look after your children and it's the heartbreak of just what it was like did you say that there was a after 1816 there's a drop in there that, no, basically there, there were no services nepal has it's an extraordinary very different history but um there were just hardly any sorts of health education it's like, which is why come nepal in 1950 you had a two percent literacy rate which is sort of the, sort of the best guess there were the the regime did not believe in education because that would foment discontent so you had no services so if there wasn't anything um you, you couldn't do it which is why the old the practice of variolation in the communities even using live smallpox vaccine and the traditional the IV, the um, traditional healers would go a case of smallpox would appear in the village and they go and the heat would come and would get a matter from the pustules and they would use that to then they'd have vaccination they'd have variolation camps and they would be given to the children children died but not at the rate that if they had nothing so the risk even of using something like that was better and so that was widely the practice and again um that doctor I mentioned who went out in, in the campaign in 1973 and he was now and he became a senior official he had been variolated as a child and he sort of remembered remembered that sort of experience um, no, that's intriguing 1816 is the year of the Pangyo Nepal or Pangyo Gurkha War yes maybe a British officer of no what is absolutely interesting and i can say this because i discovered the letters in the british library and the request it was linked to the anglo Nepal war yep but and the british imposed a resident on to they had to accept it who was very unpopular but nepali government officials went and said we want vaccination and it's there in the letters and that british resident who was trying to rebuild relations and so here's the politics knew that he had to make this work if he wanted to establish better relations with with nepal and so all the problems so vaccine matter was got and is actually district got taken to Kathmandu, and um and then they sort of vaccinated um so at, at the time in 1816 because there was an epidemic so it's a fascinating um story and i'll plug there's an article in the journal medical history around um around that that story so that i don't monopolize the questions compared to the indian subcontinent like nepal was not part of british india as you no. know so right. how did it compare like you know there was more british influence further south there might have been better vaccination rates yeah south. i can't really comment sort of on in and very different um very different experiences and one of the problem the things when you're looking at nepal's history is 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 seeing that they are quite separate because nepal was never colonized um and that makes it a very interesting country to to learn about so it's they both missed some things 
um, and other things um, that they never had, they didn't never had those, those problems. So yes, close relations and varying time, but Nepal had Gurkha soldiers, which the British army wanted. Um, and that enabled Nepal to keep the country um, at arm's length of the, of the British. Um, oh yes, right, ah, oh. do we? Um, do we know the number of negative reactions to the vaccine in New Zealand during this epi ep epidemic? I don't think we can put um, numbers because exactly what is um, a negative reaction? They have, um, do you mean the actual negative, uh, do you mean negative reactions to the actual vaccine itself? Um, Alan, is Alan, are you able to, do, can you hear me? Or can you reply? Um, the numbers I think of negative reaction, this is outside my, um, my expertise, but I think the, I think the net, the negative, um, I think, um, all right, thank you. How many people are sick as a result? Um, I think the numbers will be actually small. You, most people expect to have a bit of a sore arm uh, and things. Some people have felt more unwell, um, but in terms of real sickness, um, the number is very, and I don't know, can anybody here help me out with, has there been one, there's been one sort of link to a cardiac problem or something, but I'm just wondering, is anybody in the audience here who can help me out on that? I don't know the numbers, but I think, you know, myocarditis and pericarditis tend to be linked with Pfizer, but mm. extremely small numbers and people are people mm. So. And I think there are other things as well that are, you're more at risk of getting it from something else um, and things. All right, so I think, thank you. Um, Alan, I'm not sure if you heard that reply. One of the um, members of the audience says, it, you know, there have been, um, it has been linked, the Pfizer has been linked with myocarditis, something, but the actual numbers are very small. And in fact, you're more at risk of getting that from something from something else other than the vaccine. So it's it's incredibly safe. COVID. Yes, yes. I think that's thank you, Susan, for that wonderful presentation. Thank you, Jody. Yeah, you spoke about the importance of trust, and I'm just wondering from the reflections about the Nepal success story, mm. um, are there lessons that we can draw on how can trust be built or strengthened? Are there strategies, uh, for example, engaging local people, um, more dialogue, um, addressing the misinformation mm. that we can apply I, I, for the yeah. new, new context? Mm. I think what's re it's is is going community level bottom up and um, working working sort of in the community. So even if I take that story about um, COVID at the end in the Mount Everest area, that area has been able to set up with that because of extraordinarily strong community support, trust of the local, um, the local doctor um, there. And I know from my sort of our time uh, in Nepal, so that story that I, that picture I showed you of where and talked about injections kill babies. The reason in the end why that lodge owner decided to bring the chat was because they trusted 
the star at Kundi. And so it, it, over the previous years, people have tried to take back seed and hope they come, but it um, so they had to work, they worked out within the villages and things that they were going going to try it. Um, but it's I think essentially working with, as you say, people that you trust. And certainly I ha we had um, some of you know we uh, my husband and I and our family spent two years as volunteers with Sir Edmund Hillary's the Himalayan Trust up at Kundi Hospital, which is how I got um, into talking about um, how I got interested in smallpox because the, um, the, an epidemic reached the mountains in 1963. And that was, um, as I say, the start of, of that. But we had, in terms of that postcode, vaccination story, lots of vaccination stories where um, people would accept from us that even though we were outsiders, we were part of an organ that was trusted. One day, uh, one day we had um, the mother came with her son and for measles vaccination to the monk to the clinic for the and it needed making up into a um, it came and it needed and we 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 couldn't open it before you know before the clinic but here we had mother who walked three hours with her child um, wanting the vaccine. It also happened that her husband the was a Rinpoche at the monastery and this was a married sort of monastery. So we said, look, and she had come the day before because she had all these duties during the next day's festival. So what we did, we said to her, so look, don't worry, you go home, you do that. After the clinic, we'll come out and we'll take, bring you the vaccine and we'll come and we'll vaccinate um, your, your little boy, which is what we did. So, um, and it, well, I, I say we, actually my daughter did. And she walked and she was then to where the, the lodge where one of our staff members um, lived and they went, it went up. So working, it can work in all sorts of different ways, but it's really getting into what works in the different communities and it will be different. So what works in one place might not work in sort of something else, but go in, go in at ground, at ground level. Um, and I could even say that with, when we were there, the polio national immunization days started, um, this was 1996 and in, um, so it was December and we, uh, so we, all the under fives um, were to be given sort of the polio drops, irrespective of whether they'd already um, been vaccinated. And so I was coordinating in our area and we, un we had both our staff, we had government staff, because we had the fridge. So it had to go in the thing. And we also had teachers sort of um, helping. We were given a target um, and our number was sort of was, you know, was, was down for our for, for Kundi. And yet we knew we had all the children bar one family. And that family was a Kami, was a sort of what you call who you'd call today Dalit. Um, and so we we went down and we we took it to them because they'd been sort of reluctant. To, to come, um, so we took it sort of. So then that's local knowledge about how things, about how things sort of work. Um, uh, so I think, I think one of the things also with the eradication program and talking with um, some people who worked with it, a lot of it was, was really important is that you did learn. Um, you learned a lot as you went along, you learned from local communities and 
what was different about the smallpox eradication campaign compared with malaria? Malaria was much more one size fits all, this is what you do. Um, smallpox was different and there was room for um, variation and adapting to um, two different communities, two different countries, different situations um, and sort of things. So as I say, bottom up um, make, and make it easy, get rid of the barriers. Um, right. Thank you very much, well, Sue. Uh, thank you. It is obviously a topic that we could discuss all sorts of ramifications at home, couldn't we? Yeah. Um, but uh, thank you again and mm. appreciation. <laughs> lovely to be able to come and talk to you as you can see it, it's a topic that I'm very interested in. Yeah.